How many of y'all think you're going to remember everything I say? So it might be good for you to write a few things down, okay? And, uh, and take a note. You don't write down, you, you know, just things that I say. Write down what God's saying to you. There's many times in a message that God is saying something maybe just a little bit different than what the guy's preaching on, and that's, uh, that's what I want you to write down. What is God saying to you through the message, okay? So we can put, go ahead and go with the first slide up there, Scott. Y'all are going to be surprised what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm sure. That's not it. <laughs> so what are we going to be talking about today? Okay, what is it all about? <laughs> what is it all about? It's all about what? And uh, I don't know if you're getting tired of this. Are y'all getting tired of hearing the same thing over and over? Uh, there's a reason for me saying the same things over and over and over. It's because I'm hoping uh, that it's going to stick with you. Because I'm not just trying to communicate a bunch of information. I'm trying to give you something uh, that you can live on during the week. Something that you can apply to your life. It's no good to go to church and just hear a bunch of words. Amen? Just to go and hear a bunch of words, hear a good message, hear a good sermon, hear a good song. Uh, that's not what it's about. You should leave here with a closer relationship with God as a result of being here. Am I right or wrong? So uh, it is everything, everything. I know you hear this all the time. Are y'all remembering any of this? How many of y'all, now don't, don't lie, but how many of y'all are remembering some of this, that it's all about relationship? Raise your hand. Are you, are you thinking about it during the week? Are you thinking about it that everything, listen, from the time that you opened up your eyes this morning until you go to sleep tonight, everything in between is God causing things to happen in your life to draw you closer to Him. Everything, good, bad, indifferent, uh, good things in relationships, bad things, everything, everything thing from the time you wake up to you go to sleep is God creating circumstances, God creating problems, God creating good things in your life to draw you to himself. That's why you live. You live for that. You're living for the Lord. You're living to develop a closer relationship with him, right? Right? So, you know, I mean, Listen, I mean, I, I didn't intend to go into this, but it might help. The story of the whole Bible is this. God created man. They had an awesome relationship. Man blew it and they lost it. And the rest of the Bible is about God trying to come back into relationship with man. And then at Calvary, God made a way where man and God could have that relationship again. But there, we have some glitches and, and the epistles and the stuff, the letters that we have, is about God working out glitches so that we can have a better relationship with him. What is the whole Bible about? The whole Bible is about God wants a relationship with you. Everything you read in the Bible, listen, you can take your Bible, you can go home and do this, and just let it fall open, read a few passages wherever it opens up. I challenge you to do this. Read a few passages, and you'll find those few passages that you read is about what? God wanting a better relationship with you or beginning a relationship with you. I don't care where you open up, whether it's a prophecy, it doesn't matter what it is, it's about relationship, relationship, relationship. So I want you to get the point, God wants to know you. Now that's cool, because He doesn't need you. Right or wrong, does God need you? Do you have anything that God needs? No, there's nothing God needs or He wouldn't be God, right? He's God because He has need of nothing. He has need of no one. But God is saying, listen, I'm God and I don't need anything. He existed in eternity past without man, without the earth, without the universe. He just coexisted with Him, triune self, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that perfect fellowship. But then they created mankind so that God could have relationship with us. Now, that's awesome and we make so little of it you know it's like well do you know the Lord yeah I know the Lord do you know what you're saying I know God I mean we just throw it out see if I stood up here and said well you know I'm, I'm personal friends with Billy Graham uh, Benny Hinn and I you know we had lunch yesterday y'all would go oh, God walks with me every second of every day and it's like 
were more impressed with the fact that I know Billy Graham or had lunch with Benny Hinn than that God lives in me and walks with me and I know Him. So we've just made it kind of a, yeah, I know God. And you know, it's awesome to me that God is after us. God's pursuing you. And I've heard it so many times, you know, I found God. How many of y'all have ever heard that? I found, you didn't find God. God wasn't lost. God found you. God started the whole thing. You've heard me, those that have been around long enough have heard me preach. God is the initiator of our salvation. He's the one that came after you. No man can come to the Father except by Him. So God initiates it. God is the one that pursued you. God came after you. And you have nothing to offer God. But God wants to know you. Even in our sin. Even in all of our imperfections. All of our issues and demons and problems. God says, I still want to know you. Because you have great value to me. You're important to me. You're so important to me. And I want to know you so bad. I will have them murder my son on a cross. So that we can get to know each other. Does that make you worth something to God? That he was willing to bankrupt heaven, send his son to shed his blood so that you could say, I know God. It cost him everything he had to draw you into that relationship. But to think that God pursues us. Now, I've said this and I'm going to say it again. Religion, religion is man's pursuit of God. Christianity is God's pursuit of man. What is religion? What is religion? And Christianity is what? God pursuing man. But what is religion again? Yeah, and you know what? It's very easy. Listen to me. It's very easy for us to fall into that. You know, we think of the Pharisees as bad people. But uh, the Pharisees were really very good people. They, they were moral. I mean, listen, you'd much rather have a Pharisee as your neighbor <laughs> than anybody else. Does that make sense? I mean, if you had a Pharisee as your neighbor, then you could trust them, and they were moral and kind, and they went to church, you know, and they did all those kind of things. They were good people. But what happened is their religion, a little at a time, began to get twisted. And it quit being God-centered, and it became what? It became man-centered. See, it wasn't all about having a relationship with God. It became performance-based for how can I please God so that He'll like me more. See, I'm going to give my tithes, and maybe this will, I can earn favor from God. Uh, you know, I'm not going to, the, the Pharisees, it's hilarious. You ought to just do a study. It's it's. it's really comical the the pharisees uh had blinders that they would wear so that they wouldn't lust and uh, and because of that they would run into things and they would be bleeding they really called them the bleeding pharisees and they were proud of that you know yeah i'm bleeding because see i'm not lusting <laughs> but you know what they were thinking in their heart <laughs> and jesus said that listen you can say you don't commit adultery but i say that if you lust upon a woman you've already committed adultery he took an outward religion and made it inward and he was basically saying, I don't care. In all of your goodness, it's not good enough. He's saying, don't you understand that it's not about your performance, but it's about something that's going to happen on Calvary's Hill? That's what it's all about. It's not about you, and it's not about all of your good deeds and all the great things. Because, see, once you get into that realm, you're the center of your Christianity. And God's not the center. It becomes about your performance and not God's performance. How many of y'all are hearing what I'm saying? And so religion is man's pursuit of God. Now, see, it's just like this. Is church important? Yes, absolutely. You know why it's important? Because God wants us to be there. <laughs> Bottom line, God says we ought to go. You don't need any more reason. So we go. But does going to church, is, is that the way to approach God? Is that how you get favor with God? Is that how you get God to like you more? No, you go to church to develop your relationship with God, but church isn't the means that's going to get you close to Him. 
It's just grace that's going to get you close to God. So God's pursuing us. And let me tell you, we think as God pursues us that uh, everything good's going to happen. How many of y'all know that that's not true? How many of y'all know that God can cause bad things to happen to get your attention? So now we call them what? Bad. God calls it good. Why does God call it good? Because it was that thing in your life that made you seek after him. That's good to God, but bad to you, right? So it's according to whose perspective you're looking at it from. Are you looking at it from man's perspective or God's perspective? See, more important to God is to know you, not for you to have an easy life. See, we think it's all about blessings and everything's going to be good and everything's going to be easy. It's not all about that to God. It's about knowing you and having a deep personal relationship with you. And if that means difficulties have to happen in our life, adversity has to happen in our life in order to get our attention or to draw us closer to himself, then God will allow adversity. Amen? You all have heard of Max Lucado, right? Uh, my favorite author. I'm going to read something to you uh, by Max. And it says, pursued by God. How far do you want God to go in getting your attention? Boy, I like that, don't you? If God has to choose between your eternal safety and your earthly comfort, which do you hope he chooses? What if he moved you to another land, as he did Abraham? What if he called you out of retirement remember Moses how about the voice of an angel or the bowel of a fish a la Gideon and Jonah <laughs> how about a promotion like Daniel or a demotion like Samson God does what it takes to get our attention isn't that the message of the Bible the relentless pursuit of God I like this. God on the hunt. <laughs> God in the search. Peeking under the bed for hiding kids. Stirring the bushes for lost sheep. Cupping hand to mouth and shouting into the canyon. Wrestling with us as Jacob. For all of its peculiarities and unevenness, the Bible has a simple story. God made man. Man rejected God. God won't give up until he wins him back. From Moses in Moab to John on Patmos, God is as creative as he is relentless. <laughs> Amen? As he created some things in your life. The same hand that sent manna to Israel sent Uzziah to death. The same hand that set the children free from Israel also sent them to captivity in Babylon. Tender and tough, faithfully firm, patiently urgent, eagerly tolerant, softly shouting, God's voice gently thundering, I want you. And your response, Jesus said, I am the bread that gives life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the door. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I am life. I'll come back and take you with me. Jesus proclaimed, ever offering, but never forcing, standing over the crippled man. Do you want to be well? <laughs> eye to eye with the hand with the blind man, he healed do you believe in the Son of Man? Near the tomb of Lazarus, probe in the heart of Martha. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Martha, do you believe this? Honest questions. Thundering claims. Gentle touch. Never going, we're not invited. But once invited, never stopping until he finishes. Until a choice has been made. God will whisper. He will shout, he'll touch, and he'll tug. He'll take away our burdens, he'll even take away our blessings. Amen? 
If there are a thousand steps between us and him, he will take all but one. And he'll leave the final one to us. The choice is yours. That's God. And God says, I want to know you. Is that pretty incredible? That God, the God of the universe that spoke this thing to existence, the majesty of God, the glory of God, the omnipresence of God, the omnipotence of God, I mean, all of who God is says, I will do whatever it takes to draw you to myself. I want to know you. I want to be a friend. I want to be your Lord. I want to be your God. I want to be your comforter. I want to be your Savior. I want to be all of that and more to you. And that's more important to Him than your well-being, than your blessings, than your happiness. Because this is temporal and God knows He's eternal. God doesn't want you to have uh, everything easy here and spend eternity in hell. God would rather it be tough here to draw you into a relationship with Him that you can spend forever with Him in heaven. Amen? And, and I think what happens in church, I think we get so sidetracked and it's so easy, it's so subtle. <clears throat> a lot of religion can become about us. Or a lot of our Christianity can become about religion. A lot of our religion can become about religion. And we can end up having church without Jesus. <laughs> Why do you think in the New Testament, uh, in Revelation, Jesus was outside of the church knocking on the door? Where was Jesus? outside of the church why wasn't he in the church and he's knocking on the door and he says behold if anybody in there would open the door I'll come in and I'll sup with you and you with me but somebody needs to let me in because over the years you've locked me out and I know a lot of churches don't want Jesus in church because I mean he can really stir up a mess and if you don't believe me read Matthew Mark Luke and John when Jesus showed up at church what did he do the church people got mad at him. No different today. Don't fool yourself and think it's different today, that we're better today. Let me tell you, if Jesus showed up in Texarkana and went from church to church, we'd have more church splits and church fights over Jesus than any other issue you can imagine. I guarantee it. Because he'd say something that'd tick you off. He'd say something that'd make you mad. He'd say something that'd disturb you that you didn't want to hear. And we'd all call him the false messiah. We wouldn't put him on a cross, but we'd try to get him in the electric chair. Right or wrong? Because somebody's going to rock our boat and say something, and why would he be saying that to us? See, Jesus wouldn't say something to you to, out of anger. Jesus wouldn't say something to you to tick you off and to mess up your life. He wants to rock your boat so that you'll look to him. Because he wants to draw you to himself. And sometimes it takes adversity to do that. Listen, most people I've met that's come to the Lord, their testimony is this. I was at the bottom of the barrel. I got to the bottom of life. I was facing the pen or I was facing uh, a tax audit <laughs> or whatever it was. And I just turned to God and I got saved. I wish I'd have done it a long time ago. Very few people say, yeah, life was smooth. I was being blessed. My bank account was big. And I just turned to Jesus to get saved. Most people that get saved, get saved in adversity. So what's good, the adversity or to have it easy? In God's eyes, I'll create adversity because I want to know you. Now here's what happens in church. Now listen to what I'm saying. I want you to receive this, okay? We come to church and the purpose of everything, I, I, I wish I could just burn this. I wish I could brainwash you with this. The purpose of everything in life, not just church, but work, problems, good times, money, no money, is all about relationship. What is it? It's all about what? From the time you got up this morning until you got here, what was it about? It was about relationship. And so what was worship about? That's right. Now, see, if you came because, well, I like this kind of music. This is today. Uh, I don't go there because I don't like that kind of music. I go here because I like this kind of music. Uh, I like this kind of setting. Uh, I like tambourines. I don't like tambourines. I like loud singing. I don't like loud singing. I like shouting. I don't like shouting. Uh, uh, I like tongues. I don't like tongues. So you know what we end up making it about? Who is all of that about? 
It's about us. It's not about God anymore. It's about what I like. It's like Peter Lord said. Peter Lord said, if God was to ask you to bake him a cake, what kind of cake would you bake him? And we name our favorite kind of cake. We'd say, well, German chocolate. And then Peter Lord says, how do you know he likes German chocolate? You assume because you like it, that's what he would want. How do you know he wants that? We've ruled God out. See, angels. <laughs> But I mean, you know, we, we think, we think that where I'm at is right. Where I'm coming from is right. And we never pass it by God. We never stop long enough to say, God, is that really what you like? See, worship today was not about a worship team. It wasn't about the song choice. It wasn't about whether or not you got goosebumps. It wasn't whether or not you lifted your hands or whether you didn't lift your hands. It wasn't about whether or not you danced or didn't dance. It was about this. As a result of worship, did you get to know God better? Because everything in our life, from the time that we wake up till we go to bed, is God wooing us closer to Him. Did worship, was it an experience that brought you closer to God? Or was it, and really, was it a religious, emotional experience? Was it just something to get through? Was it, you know, ten more minutes and we're done with this part of the service? Or was it a tool that God used through the Holy Spirit to draw you closer to Him? Was it something that God could use that maybe He had your attention better in time of worship that He could speak to you? And the word that he spoke to you drew you closer to him. You saw him in a different light. You saw his grace, his long-suffering, his patience. You got a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. Because that worship experience drew you closer to him. He was more able to speak to you or to impress something on your heart. Say, say amen. Do you hear what I'm saying? So what is worship about? Not what we've made it today. It's not about style and rhythm and beat. It's about God and relationship. Yes or no? You know, I think God wants to bring us to the place in our relationship that you could worship if I was singing. <laughs> yeah, that's deep, isn't it? Yeah. You see, we've made it too much about performance and music and comfort and rhythm and what's the most popular songs and God is saying I'm outside can I come in no we don't like your style of music uh, you might come in and do a hymn well, we're not into hymns uh, you may do some heavy metal stuff we're not into heavy metal I mean would you be shocked if you didn't like heavy metal and you got to heaven and that's all the angels played I mean, you'd get to heaven. I know what you'd do. You'd lie. You'd get there and Jesus would say, welcome. And you'd hear that. You'd go, boy, that's just what I like, Jesus. Man, that's, whew, I love that kind of music. <laughs> you know, or for me to get there and it'd be country. <laughs> uh, my first thought would be, oh, no, I went to the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> so do you understand what worship is about? Any questions, you, I want you to ask. We're going to learn this. If we're on it two years from now, we're going to learn this. I'm just going to go over it and over it and over it until we learn it's all about everything in life is about what? That's right. So what is worship about? Relationship. Any questions, any comment about this part? Because I'm going to teach you, Okay. This isn't about me up here performing. I want to teach you this. If you disagree, that's fine. This is a chance to say, you know, I'm not sure. What about this? You know, I thought it was all about, you know, my style or whatever. I don't know. What is the purpose of prayer? What's the purpose of praying? What's the purpose of praying? Everybody? See, you hadn't got it yet or you'd say it right off the bat. Everything is about Everything is about, what's worship about? What's prayer about? Okay, let me prove to you that's what prayer is about. I'm going to answer a lot of the questions you've had. Why do you ask God for something when he already knows what you're going to ask before you ask and whether or not he's going to do it?
No, if God knows, and the Bible says He knows what you're going to ask before you ask. So if God knows a hundred years before you're born what you're going to ask when you're 13, why ask? And if God already knows what He's going to do, whether He's going to answer it, not answer it, or have you wait, why ask? Because prayer is not about you controlling the universe and telling God how to run the world. Prayer is about communicating with God so that you can develop a deeper relationship. Do you understand that? What is prayer about? See, I really believe this. You know, the disciples, they, they tried to cast the demon out of the guy. Remember that story? He was laying on the ground, foaming at the mouth, rolling in the fire. You know, the mighty men of God, they prayed. The demon wouldn't leave. He rebelled and said, I'm staying. Well, Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration with, you know, uh, Peter, James, and John. So they come down from this glorious experience, right? And, uh, and they couldn't do nothing. I mean, you'd think after something like that, you know, they would just they really have. And so Jesus walks up to the man, and he just, you know, tells the devil to leave him. Boom. You know, didn't shout, didn't yell, didn't pitch a fit, just, you know, the devil left. And then the disciples said, why couldn't we do that? Good question. It'd be nice if church people would ask that today. And Jesus said, because this kind comes out only through So was Jesus saying, now don't answer because I don't think you're going to get it right. Was Jesus saying, by you praying and going on a hunger strike, you will cause me to love the demonized boy more than I love him now. And so by you praying and getting hungry, I'm going to go, okay, I love him enough to deliver him now. You prayed it about. It's a good thought, isn't it? How many of y'all know that Jesus couldn't love that little boy any more than he loved him before he met him? So then why pray and fast? Could it possibly be that Jesus said, through your prayer and fasting, you're going to draw so close to me. You're going to be so connected to me through that relationship. I'd be able to do the very same thing through you that my Father does through me because I have such an awesome relationship with my Father. I can only do what the Father tells me to do. And the Father told me to go over here and deliver this boy. But you didn't have the relationship with the Father to be able to perform that task. But me and the Father were one. That's close. We're inseparably one. We have an unbelievable relationship. I know what the Father wants me to do. And through prayer and fasting, you'll develop that kind of relationship with me. And you'll know what I want you to do, when I want you to do it, and how I want you to do it. Yes or no? So is it about, is prayer about me manipulating God to get my way? I love this person. I want this person healed. I don't love this person. I don't care what you do with them. <laughs> or is it more about God wants an awesome relationship with me so he can tell me what the Father wants to be done and I can be the obedient servant? But the only way that's going to happen is through what? Through an unbelievable relationship that's on, that maybe only come through prayer and fasting. Maybe come through worship. Let me ask you another question. What is the purpose of Bible study? See, y'all still ain't got it? I think you think I'm going to trick you. You know, I'm not going to try to trick you, okay? What is the purpose of Bible study? What's the purpose of worship? What's the purpose of prayer? What's the purpose of fasting? It's all about... It's all about what? God is pursuing you. And He can pursue you through a worship experience, through a prayer experience, through a, a, a fasting experience, through a Bible study experience. It's God coming after you, saying, come on! I want to know you better. I want to know you more. Are you getting that? It's by reading this that you come to know God better. You come to know Him more. Now here's what we've done. We've made the means the end. We've made what? How many of y'all understand that? Raise your hand. When I say we've made the means the end, do you understand what I'm saying? See, the means to really connect with God in a different way could be prayer, fasting, the Bible study, worship. That's the means, right? 
That's the means to connect with God in many different ways. But we take the means and make it the end. And so what we do is we worship our worship and praise our praise. We give out awards for how well you know your body, b Bible instead of giving out awards for how well you know your Lord. Yes or no? And so now we're in a race to know the Bible better than this person over here. I can quote more scripture than you. I've got more degrees in it than you. Uh, I've studied it longer than you. I've memorized more verses than you. I've been to more Bible studies than you. We've taken an awesome, beautiful thing that can bring us into an incredible revelation of who God is so that we can know Him more and we've turned it into a man-made thing. Why do you suppose there's so much division over every one of those areas I just mentioned in churches? Are we divided over worship? Are the churches in the world divided over worship? Yeah. Are churches divided over prayer? Whether you pray in tongues, don't pray in tongues. Whether you pray out loud, don't pray out loud. Everybody prays out loud. Everybody prays softly. Are we divided over that? Are we divided over theology and what the Bible teaches? I mean, every church has a different theology. Am I right? Do you know why we're divided over all that? Have you ever asked that? Why have we become divided over prayer, worship, praise, Bible study, doctrine, theology, fasting, whether or not you should, uh, tithing, it's an Old Testament thing, it's a New Testament thing, it's a law, it's grace. We're divided under that doctrine. Why are we divided over all of those things? Why? Because we've made it about who? We took a beautiful thing and destroyed it. And God said, I don't know how y'all did this. <laughs> I mean, I gave you something awesome that would draw you close to me, and y'all have used it to bash each other. I mean, y'all have used it to turn people against one another. I mean, when I first got saved, started going to church, I thought that was supposed to be the most loving group of people I ever met. And I found out later that you go to church to find out who you're supposed to hate and not hate. <laughs> While we're supposed to hate the Baptists and hate the Charismatics and hate the Methodists and all the Church of Christ are going to hell. And we say, boy, they're wrong because they think they're the only ones going to heaven. <laughs> I mean, it may shock some of us, even disappoint some of us, to find out who gets in. <laughs> it may really shock us and disappoint us to find out who doesn't. <clears throat> we've taken an awesome thing and we've made it about man. Do you understand? God wants more than you could ever imagine to know you and for you to experience Him daily. And that he's paid an unbelievable price for that? What is obedience about? What's obedience about? What's tithing about? I mean, really, do, do you think God needs your money? I mean, let's be serious. I mean, is God in heaven going, oh, dear God, I, I sure hope Milan ties because my kingdom will go broke if he doesn't. Boy, I hope O'Don, and I hope everybody gives her a tithe because if they don't, you know, I'm about to follow chapter 13 on the kingdom of God. Or do you suppose maybe that God has a bigger purpose in that? Do you suppose that he wants you to get to know him as what we sang, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider? I mean, do you really believe that he's Jehovah Jireh and that he can provide for you? Then if you know him as Jehovah Jireh, if you know him as your provider then what you have really isn't yours. So why don't you just toss in a tenth and a little bit more? Because it's all about, it's not about money, it's all about, do you suppose God could use money in a positive way or a negative way to draw you closer to Him? Absolutely, He does it all the time. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen. He uses money all the time. He does. He uses it in the Bible. He uses money as a means to draw you closer to Him, whether it's to give you a lot and cause you to praise Him because, you know, He's provided for you or to take it all away. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. It's not the devil taketh away and the Lord giveth. The Lord gives it and takes it away. And He says, now I want you to know me that way. Would, would you know me 
as the one that gives? Well, of course, if we're in charismatic church, everybody goes, yes! <laughs> Would you know him as the Lord that takes away? And there are certain charismatics that don't believe that. And they need to read their Old Testament and the New Testament. God gives and takes away. Why does he give? Come on now. You're going to hear about this for nine years if you don't get it right. Why does he give? Why does he take away? It's all about, are you getting it now? So what is obedience about? What is tithing about? Now let me ask you this. What are trials and temptations about? Now I'm going to ask you a really hard one. What is sin about? Do you know, I know God in a whole different light because I'm a sinner. Because I'd have never met the God of grace if I didn't first realize I was a sinner. God even takes sin and uses sin to draw me closer to Him. I begin to find out where sin abounds, much more does grace superabound. I begin to find out about the mercy of God. How can you love me, God? I'm so unworthy. I should have never done it. And God says, I love you because I'm a God of mercy. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. He never condemns you. Satan does. Satan accuses you. God never condemns because condemnation pushes you away. God will never reject someone that comes to Him. God will never push someone away because He's all about. And so He's pulling you towards Him, not pushing away. What does condemnation do? Pushes you away. What does conviction do? Draws you closer to Him. He'll convict you because conviction draws you to His grace. Yes or no? That's where you learn the God of all grace is in conviction. Condemnation, no, it's from the devil. It'll push you away. He's the God of adversity, the God of trials, the God of blessing, the God of testing. He's the God of worship, the God of praise. He's the God of fasting. He's the God of prayer. He's the God of tithing. He's the God of all of that. Wants to put it all together and use it to draw on you from every area of life. That's why you were born. You were not born to have a career. You were born to know God intimately. That's why you were born. It's all about relationship. And it's so easy. And I said this Wednesday night. My group hears this twice, and that's good for them. God probably knew they needed it twice. Um, if I, and don't answer those that were there. If I were to say, well, it's Bible study and prayer and fasting and tithing. I mean, it's, it's good for you anyway even out of God. I mean, even if I'm doing it for the wrong reason, it's still good, right? Don't answer. That's the most deadliest thing you can do. The things that God gave to us to draw Him close to Him, and we do it just to do it, or for some religious purpose, will drive you away from Him. I've seen people, honestly, listen, I've seen people get further away from God not understanding worship and praise because they turn it inward and it becomes about them and they get bitter and they get so narrow-minded that their way is the right way and everybody else is wrong and going to hell and we become Pharisees. It's very easy to become a Pharisee today because my way is the right way and I don't know what you believe about tithing but I'm right because we've turned it about me. And I'm going to tell you, if you do Bible study, if you do prayer, if you do fasting, if you do worship, if you do any of that outside of knowing that it's to draw you into a relationship, it'll do the opposite in your life. That's why church people today are some of the meanest people you've ever met. I, I hate to say that. I know it's, it's the truth. Some of the most vicious people. I, I was talking to a, a young man this week and... Uh, he, a youth pastor at his church and the whole church almost divided the pastor went on vacation they all got on the telephone they were trying to find a way to crucify him nail him get rid of him when he was on vacation 
And then he came back and the youth pastor stood for his pastor. And I mean, that whole church almost exploded. And, and so the youth pastor just went in his bedroom, fell on his knees and began to pray. Wise youth pastor. Began to pray. And God kept all those leaders of the church awake. It was a deacon possessed church. <clears throat> and kept them all awake. And the next day when they were supposed to meet with the pastor, the ones that uh, God didn't change their heart, they didn't show up at the meeting. The other ones repented. And said, I couldn't sleep all night last night. And what we're doing is wrong. You know, people in church can become very mean. And see, what that'll happen little at a time by us taking worship and making it about us, us taking Bible study and making it about who's right and who's wrong, us taking prayer and making it about, you know, who's going to pray the most and get their way with God, right or wrong, yes or no. So you got to be very careful. Listen, it's so easy. Listen to me. It is so subtle. To become a Pharisee in a Christian church. You just don't realize how easy it is. As soon as it becomes about anybody else other than God, you've become a Pharisee. If it becomes about you, if it becomes about your way, if it becomes about what you want, if anything about you is in it, then you've defiled Christianity. It's not about you. It's all about Him. And it's about Him drawing you into that relationship. Uh, and we use this. We say, uh, and, and we're going to have to learn God from different ways. How many of y'all have ever said, I know Jesus? How many of y'all have ever said, I know Jesus? What do you mean by that? Are you saying, I got saved? <laughs> Most people, when they go, I know Jesus, they're saying, I walked in Oliver Church and I got saved. No, that's not what it means. It means, you know Jesus. See, but today what does it mean? I know Jesus. I walked in, I got baptized, I joined the church, I'm saved. Right or wrong? Isn't that what it means? If somebody says, are you saved? Yes, I know Jesus. Well, what about saying something like, do you really, really know Jesus? It'd be like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> Do I really, really know Jesus? Have you ever heard somebody say this? I know the Lord. What do they mean when they say, I know the Lord? Or are they saying, I know the one, personally, that controls all of my life. I know Jehovah. I know the Lord. I have a relationship with the ruler of my life. I have a relationship with the Savior of my life. Or is it just Christian vernacular? I know Jesus. I know the Lord. Uh, uh, I know Steve. I know Mary. It was kind of the same thing, you know? <laughs> when it ought to be. No, I know them intimately through a relationship. 